chakras expanding out, radiating into the world. Drawing from the earth, reaching for the sky, expanding out. One more. And now let's do a little waking up. Get ourselves in a hot area to open up. Down my legs. In your arms a little bit. around the shoulders, and I like to do the face and neck and head. Woo. Coming back down to the kara. We connect to that, especially around the back and the sides. And then let's put our hands over our heart point and just concentrate into our center point. And now let's work with our containment breath. As we inhale, gather, let it build, and release. And dropping down into our hips a little more, let's begin to turn from there. And as we turn, have a sense of the key flowing out through our arms and fingertips, touching the walls or going through the walls. And then without any effort, invite a little more key to flow through. A little stronger, a little brighter, a little bigger. Nice, and let's bring that to a close and take a moment and just stand in it. And just sense the key flowing around us and through us. And now let's stretch our sides a little bit. And let's go all the way around three times. And reverse at the bottom. All right, and let's stretch our low backs, hands on the knees and twisting around. Other side. And again. Okay. Let's do circles with our hips. In both ways. And then our knees. In both ways. Stretching the backs of the knees and if you're comfortable squatting, the front. And again. Okay, let's do our wrist warm ups. And settling down, lengthening up, 
Strong hips opening our hearts. Other side. Softening your arms, stretch. Kuradesh. Other side. Softening your arms, stretch. Nikio. Other side. Okay, and then inside the arms. And the other side. Nice, let's shake them out. And over the head. And shake them so much that you really vibrate all the way to your toes. So you can just really get everything going and then drop them three times. And again, over the head and vibrate your whole body all the way down. Really shake them. Work it. Again. And drop them. And let's do big circles with the arms. And the shoulders. And then just working our torso a little bit. Okay. And now working with our triangle. Finding the point we're extending to way out through the wall. Imagine the smooth sides behind us. Invite Aiki spirit to flow through us. And together and back. Together and back. Together and back. And as we do this, focus your triangle. Find your point you're extending to. That's how we develop extension in Aikyo. Good concentration, way out there. And the smooth sides coming from the point, and our backs are hollow. We're a conduit for Aiki spirit to flow through us, through our arms, through our fingers, out into the world. And then let it get a little brighter. Invite a little more to come through us. Like a breeze at our back. Couple more. Okay, and hold. And let you stand for a moment and see if you can sense the triangle still. So at any point you could just extend. It's so available to you, familiar to you. Nice, let's do a little two-step. And one, two, one. To, as we turn, keep flowing through our arms and fingertips, drawing energy from the earth, drawing energy from the sky. And focusing on the space around us. Remember, it's filled with key, and it can help us move, be in the flow. Remembering heaven and earth running through us, keep flowing out through our fingertips, the space around us, moving us, connecting us to all things. Two more. Okay, let's turn and stay and take a moment. 
And just stand in that and see if you can sense the flow around you, flowing through you. Hmm. And let's work with rowing and let's uh, use our sword blade rowing. So to charge it up a little bit, if I do this with my sword blade, with my hands, I just get a little bit of charge in that whole area. Okay, so I'm finding a point out there that I'm gonna to extend to and then extend out and gather back, keeping the shoulders relaxed, the whole sword blade extends. It's a triangle going out and gather it back. Pick a point you're extending to and then gather it to you. Draw energy from the earth and the sky. Imagine it's flowing from your back through your arms. Really send it out, gather it back. Okay, and let's reach up, take some key from the sky, bring it down, and vibrate our hara. Focusing into our hara point. Focus your breath into your hara point. Stop for a moment, see if you can sense the vibration continuing. And let's do the other side. Change feet, and again, extending out, gathering back. The whole sword blade is energized. You extend all the way to the point and gather it back. Drawing from the earth, from the sky. Feeling it flow from behind you through your arms. Okay, one more time, let's reach up. Take some key from the heavens. Bring it down and vibrate our heart point. And stop for a moment, sense the vibration continuing. All right. Well, hi everybody, good to see you and Paul and Alberto and Catherine. I'm not sure who you are, but welcome. Maybe I know you, I don't see your face. Oh, Catherine, hi. Lovely to see you, okay. Um, so Kimberly had sent me something around failure, which is a big one. Um, we all work with that. I'm gonna read a little bit about what she said and then give some of my take on it and we'll, we'll do some exercises. Um, of course, she points out that we're familiar with failure as a concept. And of course, we have the idea that um, there's no success without it. Uh, but her question is, is there a way to train failure in the system without jumping to its counterpart, try to make itself feel better? And then she says, I suspect that the outset of our Aikido training, most of us did not experience an overwhelm of failure more than we experienced success or else we would have stayed, not have stayed on the map. I wonder if failure could be defined as something which we received no reinforcement or reward. If so, then it seems as though the only way to use failure positively would be conceptually, again, leading to the question about embodied training of failure. So 
she's connecting it to our class last week where we talked about intentionality and um, we talked about the difference between motivation and intention. And I read a quote from Junpa in which she said, motivation is something that makes you, you do it because it feels good and you get positively reinforced and you may, it may be totally unconscious. Whereas intention is something that you choose to do, you, you, you make an, a choice to develop something. That's his take on it. Um, yeah, training failure into our body is not our capacity to tolerate failure into our body. I think it's actually is inherent to Aikido. When I started Aikido, um, for the first six weeks to eight weeks, I would go into the dressing room and just cry for half an hour after every class. I did not feel successful at all. Um, some of it was the community. I would drive in with some friends. And so we were in the habit of driving in together, but I felt very unsuccessful. Um, but there was something, something that kind of um, was driving me. And one of my thoughts is um, we could practice with small failures. Um, I taught myself to juggle and I failed a lot. Um, and I started with oranges and then they would break and orange juice would run down my arms. So I had to move to something else. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of failure in something like that. Um, and I, I, have, I had this thing, Tefani always laughs, there can be a waste paper basket like here, here. And I will throw something in it and will not go in. It's my, it's my whole life. I just fail at getting anything in a basket. It can be right in front of me. And like once a year, I'll throw something and it'll go in. But I mean, literally it can be here and I'll throw it and it won't go in. Um, and it's something I've learned to just have a sense of humor about that level of failure because it's just bizarre to me that I can't, <laughs> I can't do that. So I think training our bodies with small things, trying things we can't do, some weird dance class that we're not gonna be good at or open mic or learning to juggle so that we get used to not being able to do something and not have any initial success. So that's just my, my response to your question. How do we train failure in the body? Um, and then what I did is I looked up, um, cause in my, one of my books, I talk about the Polinsky principles. Peter Polinsky was a Russian engineer. Um, and he said, he believed that real world most real world problems are more complex than they appear. And problems have a human dimension and a local dimension. So somehow I'm not making the local dimension with the baskets that I try to make. Um, and they're likely to change as circumstances change. So his thing was um, try new things. And this was the one I loved, fail at scale. So in your talk, you talked about um, that the failure is without reward or reinforcement. So in our business, we tried something new and we failed. We failed at scale, we lost money, things didn't work out, but we didn't go bankrupt, if you know what I mean. So it's so something about failing at scale. And I think Aikido teaches us to fail at scale as well. We know when we go to the next level, we're gonna fail, but it's sort of at scale. Um, and then there's an interesting book that you might want to check out. It's called Adapt, Why Success Always Starts with Failure. And um, he says, here's the thing about failure and innovation. It's a price worth paying. We don't expect every lottery ticket to pay a prize, but we, but if we want a chance at winning that prize, we buy the ticket. The pattern of innovation returns is heavily skewed toward the upside. That means a lot of small failures and a few gigantic su successes. So, and then I'm just gonna add one more thing before we do practice, which is um, when we do leadership embodiment and it's built into Aikido, it comes from Aikido and you extend and you open up, you get more testosterone in your system. And one thing that testosterone does is it um, activates big picture thinking and risk taking. So when we're bigger and we're more expansive, 
we're often willing to take more risk, which means our system is inherently geared to handle more failure, right? So if we're in a small place and we just want to succeed, um, then we're going to be afraid of risks. We don't want to take risks. But if we can get more expansive, um, we'll tend to be more willing to take the risk and try. And then, of course, the last piece that Kimberly mentioned, too, is um, not being attached to the outcome. And, um, and I think that's just an, an everyday practice of remembering that we're going to lose everything. That's my recommendation. Just remind yourself every day. And so you can appreciate that you have it. Um, and you know you may not have it in the next day. And that, that really it sets the ground for helping me be less attached to outcome because, you know, who knows if I'll ever be there for the outcome. So those are my thoughts around failure. Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts, but first let's do a little exercise and let's do an exercise um, of just doing a ski punch. And from the point of view of, um, can you do it perfectly? Because that sets up our capacity to fail. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So we're just going to, everybody knows how to do ski, or you kind of know. So are you going to step forward and do it? Are you going to stand and do it? Are you going to ski with your thumb up, with your knuckles? Um, so just tell yourself that you want to do a perfect punch, a perfect ski. And then you, you have to get into the detail. What does that mean? Where does it come from? Is it powerful? Is it relaxed? All those things. And then my guess is after we do a number of them, you'll experience some failures <laughs> and you might get a good one. But sort of what, what's that like? So let's just take a few minutes um, and just practice punching and just see what that's like. Okay, so let's come in and um, have a little check-in. And I'm curious um, if you have any thoughts either on failure um, and or how it's related to trying to do something perfectly and what that might bring up for you. Any thoughts, anybody? Did you do a perfect punch? A perfect ski. Wendy, Sensei. Hi, Kat. Hi. You know, if one were to make a sound when they punched, what sound would that be? Well, generally speaking, what's recommended is a vowel sign. Vowel sound, sorry. So I, E, A, O. Those oh. are the recommended sounds from a martial arts point of view because what they do is they sharpen the focus. You go, ah, oh, you don't do that because that, that kind of um, opens the focus, but E, I, O, oh, those, that, that creates a sharpness, which um, brings more intensity to your movement. So that's okay. what's generally recommended in martial arts. Oh, good, thank you. Okay. Anyone else, did you do the perfect punch or what was it like not to fail or what's your thoughts on failure?
or not. There's Michelle, yay. Well, I noticed that um, when failure comes up, I'm imagining someone else is watching me. There's a judge in the room. Yeah. And whereas when I'm just doing it, the just the experience of it, um, there's an acceptance and a curiosity and more like, oh, everyone's different. And gee, how was that? But when that judge shows up, and I was just noticing, oh, there's a judge over there. And there were all kinds of judges that were, had different criticisms. And it was fun to um, just, you know, name them and check them out. <laughs> I like that. Yes, you know, masukatsu, asukatsu, true victory is victory over self. So we're the ones that tend to be our biggest critics. Nice, thanks, Michelle. Any other thoughts on trying to do something perfectly and how that might connect to failure. For me, I, um, when I was trying to do it perfectly, I found I was like, it was hard to focus on the, the whole. So I had to, you know, I was like, oh my thumb, oh my this, oh my that, you know, so there are all these different angles and I couldn't um, kind of tap into the whole to the wholeness of it. Yeah, a little bit of that self-critic that I think Michelle was talking about. I definitely had mine. It's like, oh, every time I have to straighten up a little bit and that kind of thing. Or I, I, there's some tension in my shoulder. I needed to relax that because I want power, right? So a good punch has power and that creates tension and then can I relax it? And there's all that kind of layering of trying to do something well. Catherine, did you have a thought? Oh, she's frozen. I did. Uh, um, it elicited anger, feelings of anger coming out. And that, that, I, that, that was the judgment. I said, okay, then it's a punch. Sure, it's not supposed to be when we expect to not punch. It was that emotion that so elicited. Yes, the movement is often associated with aggression, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, that's something in Aikido that we train ourselves to have a feeling of power without aggression. So it's just, um, I, it's something I love about Aikido is it, it's trained me to do that, to be able to be really, really powerful and do it. I mean, sometimes I'm aggressive. I'm not suggesting I'm <laughs> never, but, and there, when I'm, in the flow, I often feel quite powerful and non-aggressive. So aggression, aggression we, we unpacked that some classes ago, has to do with sort of an intent to do harm. And so if I can be powerful with the intent to give something to somebody, like in Aikido, we give that movement so they can do a technique. But for people who are not trained, that is often connected with a feeling of anger or, or, or that. So I, I get your point. Paul, did you have a thought? Uh, well, yeah, because I'm completely untrained in this. You're not <laughs> completely know. untrained. You're just not no. quite as trained as some. But I've never had a lesson on how to do this. So there was no expectation. <laughs> It's just like more playful because it was like um, the beginner's mind. It's like I have, there's no comparison. I have nothing to compare it to. And uh -huh. so it was kind of freeing that way. <laughs> well, that is when we're new at something or newer, we generally have less of a judgment because as you say, there's less to compare it to. All right, well, let's do it again. And this time, rather than trying to do it perfectly, um, let's use the thing we do in Aikido a lot, which is um, let it come through us. So instead of I'm punching and I'm going to be powerful and I'm going to do it perfectly, what if I could just tap and, you know, maybe you've seen a teacher do it or you've, you've seen somebody do it or um, you yourself have, have experienced that. And so you want to kind of tap something to come through you to do the punch rather than self-generating. Because what we just did is we were doing the punch. We were doing the ski. So now let's see if we can connect a little bit 
more broader to Aiki spirit, or it can be a teacher or a particular memory of a vision or something. And what's it like to, as if it comes from behind you or below you, above you, all around you, and something else moves you. And what's that like? And how does, does that bring up anything around failure or critics? So let's take a few minutes, see if you can tap a flow, the flow state, let the flow state move you into that form, which is a ski, a punch. Let's have another check-in and see um, how was that different? Did that change the, the critic for, for those of us that had a bit of a critic? Did it change the, yeah, Mandy? Uh, that, was, that was certainly different. That was interesting. The first time I was more, um, me doing it, was more interested in the form and the hips connecting to the um, arm as it went out to punch. And I noticed that right away. Um, and then, and, and it was more outward focused, like the body, you know, the form of the body. The second time um, I started doing it and all I said in between, all I could hear my mind saying was, and what's next? Mm. And what's next? There was no critic. There was nothing. It was just a, just being one with the movement. I have no idea of how it looked from the outside. Did care. I wasn't in that space. Um, but it was just more flowing, more open, easier. Very nice. I have something a little bit similar. Yeah. Thanks, Mandy. Anyone else? How was? What was that like, or how was it different from the first one? Is there a critic? Yeah. Yes. Sensei, um, I noticed that the critic didn't even show up mm -hmm. uh, because the intent was coming from someplace else. Um, and the feeling was much like doing a Tencon turn um, that just feels so natural, flowing, and open, and I know it. Um, and I didn't. I didn't in, even intentionally decide not to think about it. It just kind of went through it, and it happened. And the critic just didn't show up. So that was kind of cool. It is. I mean, I think it's something. It's a technique that I use sometimes to try to move me from my critic and my um, my concern about success or failure. Like if I remember that I can let it come through me and there's something bigger than me, I, I have less, I get less caught up in that story about I'm good, I'm bad, it's good, it's bad, that kind of thing. Anyone else? Um, for me, I had the experience, um, for me when I do the clap, I'm joining with protectors of peace, past, present, future. 
Nice. And I felt that I was in this flow of ski, like forever. <laughs> all the skis, just woo, all the people doing ski and this beautiful, it was just really, um, uh, strange and wonderful. <laughs> well, and, and I think probably some of us had a similar thing. I guess the challenge is when we get back on the mat, like how do we bring that through and not get caught in, I do it to you and I'm doing it well and I'm not doing it well. And, you know, that, that sense of um, success and failure and, and the critic and so on. But I think like anything, it's like Kimberly was pointing out with, when the question she asked is like, how do we train it with our body to train throughout the day to invite flow to come through us? Small things, whether it's washing the dishes or going to the store, you know, if we train it there, it may, it may seem silly, but if we train it there, we get so familiar with it that we can bring it into a situation that's more low grade threat, which is Aikido training or more challenging interactions with people. But I think we need to train it in our everyday um, sort of life in, in, the, in the most mundane and simple way we can. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then we can be much more familiar with flow and access it more, more quickly. And of course, you know, it, for me, it's always good to have a particular trigger. So I think if this and such was coming through me, if Mother Teresa was coming through me or O Sensei was coming through me or um, the Dalai Lama, it's like I use very particular archetypes. You could use nature, if a mountain was coming through me, water, sky, and you could use anything you want, um, animal, archetypes, but something that helps you to focus your flow, your sense of flow. So it's not just kind of random flow, but it's more specific. That would be my recommendation. Um, yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, it was interesting because the first round, I felt like um, the rhetoric in my head was familiar and the movements I was making was familiar. And then the second time around, it felt like I'd come to ground and, and it was new. It's like the movement, it's like, oh, wow, look at, you know, it's like, it was unfamiliar and very uh, surprising, even though I, I know the movements, but it, it, felt, it felt like it was a, a new movement every time. Yes, I see some nods. I mean, you know, it's like, we have access to that, but we get amnesia. And we're just so used to being me and I do it and I'm good or I'm bad or I'm successful or I'm not. It, that's just habit, it's such a deep habit. And you know, in Aikido we train to break habits, the habit of tightening up when we're attacked or attacking when we're attacked. That's one of the things we train in Aikido is to break that habit and have a habit of how do you flow when you're attacked. So we can do it, we just have to put time in. You know, it's how many repetitions did you do in the Aikido map before you could do a decent roll or before you could do a decent kurgaish or any of that. So I'm going to say, you know, some of us are getting back on the mat a little bit, but we still, we can still practice a lot even when we're not on the mat. So let's do one more round and this time let's imagine we're receiving the ski. <clears throat> so you know the, the drill, um, Paul, I think you've done this too. It's coming and I just pivot with it and just have a sense of um, letting it flow. So let's stay with the flow for a little bit longer so we get used to it. Imagine the strike is coming and then you're just gonna pivot with it. And then see if you can, if you feel like moving a little bit after you pivot, that's fine if you just wanna pivot, but see if you can stay in that sense of inviting flow and be more clear about how do you invite it. So take a couple of minutes. <coughs> Imagine it's coming to your solar plexus or wherever and pivot. As if something's coming through you.
Okay, let's check in and just see. Were you able to uh, stay connected to the flow, or did what did you use to stay connected to the flow? Because you need a little. Sometimes it's good to have a technique to get yourself dialed in, as we say. Any thoughts on how you dialed in? Um, so I'd say one thing I did was to um, connect, er, not early, but outside of my field, let's say, or try to um, catch that extension um, out there and then and and then receive it. And that that seemed to help that flow. Yeah, and I think that um, connects to our the earlier statement about when we're more expansive and we've got more testosterone, we can take more risks. So we can have kind of a sense that it's okay to let that come in and with us instead of like defending myself against it. So that extension and that openness, um, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. It actually makes us feel more um, confident, I think. Any other thoughts on how you dial in? Yeah, Michelle. Uh, well, I think I approached it a little differently, Sensei. I was very much aware of what you share with us about letting the space be the shock absorber. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm using that a lot right now with this chaotic children all over the place <laughs> acting out. <laughs> and um, it's really helpful. And I found that in doing this practice, the TenCon, the space just kept getting bigger and bigger and like more, um, you know, when you say stand and feel it, I could just really feel the, um, the resourcefulness of the flow in the space. Mm. Oh, that's nicely said. Thank you. That resourcefulness of the flow in the space. Yeah. So thank you. It's been helping me a lot. <laughs> I've been needing it a lot. <laughs> Any other thoughts? It helps me to imagine I'm on the mat, actually. That somehow the movements go better. It's, it, I do the same with meditation. I kind of imagine that I'm sitting with like 4,000 other people around the world and somehow it, the, my movements are, are become more um, in tune. Yeah. Well, I think that's that same principle that expansion, expansiveness puts us into a more resourceful state, as Michelle was saying, when we're bigger and we feel like we're connected to more. And when we um, get triggered and we tighten up, we feel more isolated and more separate. And then that um, critic pops in and then the sort of whole success failure thing um, starts to come into play. So any way in which you can figure out how to sort of dial in to your sense of flow. What do you use? How do you wake it up? How do you connect to it throughout the day? Um, it'll become more familiar to you and then you can use it on the mat and in places where there's more of a real challenge. So I encourage us all to do a little bit of homework and, and play with it. Grocery stores, every, pretty much everyone grocery shops. So that's a great place to be in flow. <laughs> And um, I like to include the other shoppers because usually people are like in their own carts and pushing around. So just to be more expansive and inclusive. Um, it's a practice. It's just an, a place to practice. Okay, so um, if you've got a bow pen, um, grab your bow pen. If not, you can use your arm for this exercise. Yeah. Okay, if you don't have a bow can, you can just use your arm and do the whole thing with your arm. But uh, if you have the bow can, let's take it out. Feet shoulders width apart. Pointing the bow can up toward the sky and stir the cosmic soup. And let's invite wisdom traditions of all time, all place, and all eons to come and support our intentions for good in the world. And lightning ride the heaven. 
and bring it into us. Oh. And now let's work just a little bit with our um, figure eight. So starting over your head, Paul, if you're new to this, the foot goes back, it pulls the bow can down, it pops up, other foot goes back. So you're making a figure eight. And your leg is actually pulling the both hands. Hands are relaxed. Shoulders are relaxed. There's a sense of flow. And the energy flowing out the tip of the both hand. But it's the lower body that's the engine for this. And the arms just direct a little bit. Long exhales. And just letting the flowing power quality of the bokeh come through you a little bit more. Okay, let's just stop and stand with the bokeh and just see if you can sense the flow around you, the figure eight energy going out through the bokeh. And now let's work with our decoration. And let's draw a little bit from the sky, draw from the earth. Imagine you've got your inspiration support behind you, coming through you, through your arms, through your bouquet, out into the world. And let's say our declaration out loud and then we'll cut it into the world. I wish to help people remember their noble, awesome, and shiny and send it out. I wish to help people remember their noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out. I wish to help people recognize their noble, awesome, and shiny. Cut once, send it out, cut again. And now a key eye. Hey! And if you don't have your book hand cast and you're using your arm, you can just send it out with your arm. Let's do it in another time. Invite a little more from the sky, pull a little more from the earth. Imagine there's flow behind you, flowing through you, out the tip of your book hand, saying our declaration. I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out. I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out. I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Cut and send it out again. And now another key Hi! Hey! Imagine it going out into the world. Let's do one more step just because threes are so good. Connecting to the sky, to the earth. All kinds of flow coming through us, through the bokeh. Ready, and I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out. I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out. I wish to help people recognize they are noble, awesome, and shiny. Send it out, and again. And now, Kia. Hey! And just stand in it for a moment. Try to sense all that flowing through you out into the world, unifying your intention. Okay, let's put our book hand to the side. Do a standing bow. And put our book hands down. And let's end with a little heaven and earth breathing. So let's just take a moment and let's pull the energy up from the earth and reach for the stars, send it out. Drawing from the earth, reaching for the sky. Let's do two more. And 
And now let you stand in it for a moment, sensing the earth below you, the sky above you, all around, key flowing through, through you. And then let's send some good energy out into the world, some positive key power. And let's take a moment to appreciate our community, our friends and training partners, our teachers, mentors, Osensei's vision, and our own hearts. So, um, Kimberly, thank you for hosting this time. Greg was otherwise in, involved. <laughs> I really, it was great to see you all. And Catherine, it was nice to see you even for a moment. Um, I certainly hope you'll send me, uh, email me, either through the website or if you have my email, any um, things you'd like to discuss or work on or think about or play with, that helps me a little bit. Um, of course, failure, we could work on that kind of forever, <laughs> along with the thing that we've been working on off and on, which is motivation and intention. We could revisit that from, from last week and that distinction between motivation and intention and how do we use our intention to really invite ourselves to the next level. So. Um, Anything else that you've been chewing on? I'll be back down to Marin. I come down on the 28th. I know that's Memorial Day weekend, but um, I hope not everyone will be gone. Uh, and I'll be teaching a Saturday class and a Monday class. So um, hopefully see some of you. And um, yeah, if not, I'll see you next week um, online. And I hope everyone has a noble, awesome, shiny week. You can see here I changed my declaration a little bit. I was walking the other day and I thought, all right, I'm gonna change my declaration to helping people recognize they're noble, awesome, and shiny. And when we're, we're in that mode, we don't have as much um, fear of blame or desire for praise, which is a gift. We're more free when we're not so stuck in praise and blame mode. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sensei. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you all. Great to see you. Have a lovely week. Bye. Bye. Sensei. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Kat. Thanks, Kimberly. You're welcome. See you next time. Yep.